Good morning, Red Cedar Church, and welcome. It's good to be with you here this morning in this digital space. And if you're visiting with us this morning, I want to say welcome on behalf of all of us here at Red Cedar Church. We're really glad to have you with us. We'd love to connect with you, whether that's through text or email, uh, maybe setting up a phone call. We have visitors with us on any given Sunday morning. And inevitably, those people, like us, come from different places with church background or who Jesus is to them. Wherever you're coming from, we're glad that you're with us this morning. I want to greet you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's the one who's brought us here, and we're here to meet with him. He's the one who sent his Son, who said these words, our call to worship this morning. Truly, truly... I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Would you join us in song? Let's join our voices together in worship this morning, singing, Oh, praise the name. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands, his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bowed Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all alone. Oh, praise the Oh, yeah. 
Today's reading is about Jesus' ascension into heaven following his death and resurrection. It's from Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 14. It's called Going Home. Jesus' friends were afraid, so they were hiding in an upstairs room with the door bolted shut. But that didn't stop Jesus. He just walked straight through the wall. It's a ghost, Thomas cried and hid underneath the table. But it wasn't a ghost. I'm hungry, Jesus said. What's for lunch? Peter gave him a fish. They all hung back and watched him eat. This can't be, they were telling themselves. It's impossible. It's not happening. But it was, right in front of them. Delicious, Jesus wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and grinned. Can a ghost do that, he winked. And then they all laughed. I'm really here, Jesus said, and he really was. Peter's heart leapt with joy, and he fell into Jesus' arms, hugging and kissing him. The others followed. They felt their hearts would burst from the happiness. The friends ate together and chatted happily. And every now and then, they'd just gaze at Jesus and have to touch him to be sure they weren't dreaming. Jesus had a real body, but this body was better. It came through death and couldn't get sick or be killed again. This body would live forever. Jesus had come back with a brand new body. Not only were sad things coming untrue, the friends realized they were becoming new again. Was God going to make everything new? Jesus said, I am the Savior and the Rescuer of the world. And they knew, because he couldn't stay dead, because Jesus had come alive again, that somehow everything would be all right. A few days later, as they were walking together, Jesus told his friends, It's time for me to go home to my father. They all looked worried. And then they remembered what Jesus had told them before he died. There is a place for you. I'll go, I'll go get it ready, Jesus had said. You know the way. Thomas had panicked. I don't know the way to get there. Yes, you do, Jesus said. I am the way and the truth and the life. When at last they reached the top of the highest hill near Jerusalem, Jesus turned to them and said, Go everywhere and tell everyone the happy news. Tell them I love them so much that I died for them. It's the truth that overcomes the terrible lie. God loves his children. Yes, he really does. Suddenly the whole sky was filled with a dazzling light. Now everyone can come home to God, Jesus said. Death is not the end of you. You can live forever with your Father in heaven, because I have rescued the whole world. And something amazing happened. Jesus rose up into the air higher and higher. They shitted their eyes and watched him go, until a cloud hid Jesus so they couldn't see him anymore. They stood looking up into the sky like that for a long time. Suddenly, two shining men appeared. What are you doing? they asked. Jesus has come, gone up to heaven. But one day he will come back, in the same way you saw him leave, from heaven and from the sky. Jesus' friends went back to Jerusalem with a strange gladness in their hearts. And something Jesus said that stuck in their minds. Even though you won't be able to see me anymore, I will never leave you. No, not ever. I will be with you, yes, always and forever. How can Jesus be with us and leave us at the same time, they wondered. They didn't understand. No, but soon they would. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this reading and the message that Jesus is coming back to us on earth and he's going and that we're safe from death and that we will and that he has gone ahead and prepared a place for us in heaven alongside him and God. And I just pray for everyone in this church that we will get something out of this message in Jesus name we pray. Amen. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to join me in reading the answer to a question from the New City Catechism. The New City Catechism is a set of teachings that helps us see how the whole Bible fits together. But before we ask and answer that question, here's a video covering the topic for today. When Paul preached before Felix and Drusilla, he essentially had three points, righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. The fact that Felix and Drusilla were in an adulterous relationship did not prevent him from speaking very clearly about the justice of God. It was, if you like, almost a hallmark of his preaching. At the end of his address in Athens, he says the same thing. God has fixed a day when he will judge the world. And this only the Bible will tell us. 
because it appears every day in our world that men and women are getting away with all their wrongdoing. But again, it's the Bible that makes clear that we won't escape detection or conviction or sentence forever, that there is going to be a payday one day. And the idea that God is too kind ever to condemn sin and that everyone in the end will go to heaven does not actually find a basis in the Bible itself. And Paul's warning in Ephesians 5 is to those who have professed faith in Jesus so that they will not pay attention to those who suggest other than what he's teaching them. Namely, that this day will come, a day that is fixed, a day that will be absolutely fair, and a day when the judgment rendered will be absolutely final. So, Red Cedar Church, will God allow our disobedience and idolatry to go unpunished? Please join me in reading the answer. No, every sin is against the sovereignty, holiness, and goodness of God and against his righteous law. And God is righteously angry with our sins and will punish them in his just judgment, both in this life and in the life to come. The good news, though, is that through Jesus, we can be free from sin and free from God's judgment. And so, please join together as Jeff leads us in prayer. Good morning, Red Cedar. It's good to be with you this morning. As I reflected upon our Easter Sunday service, I was thinking about how fun it was to see everyone on the Zoom session before the service. It was nice to spend time together, even if it was a little bit noisy and chaotic, and you couldn't tell who was saying hi to who. It reminded me of one of the things that I really value about Red Cedar, and that is the way that we are a church family, and the way that together we encourage each other and strengthen each other and help spur each other on in our relationships with God. And meeting together is one of those things that I really appreciate and I do really miss at this time, and it's nice that we can do it virtually um, over a platform like Zoom. This morning, I want to reflect in our prayer time around Psalm 84, where David speaks about how good it is to be in God's presence, in God's temple, and with God's people. So let's go ahead and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, how lovely is your dwelling place. Our soul longs, it faints, to be in the courts of the Lord. Our heart, our flesh, we sing for joy to you, the living God. We think about the bird who gets to build a nest close to your temple, and we think how lucky she is that she can be in your house all day long, just like those people who get to be in your house continually singing praise before you. Father, you say that those are blessed who put their strength or who rely on you for their strength and who set their heart towards your house, towards being with you. Father, one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that even though we can't be physically present together, that we are spiritually present together and that you are with us. In Psalm 139, you remind us that no matter where we go, you're there. If we ascend to the heaven, if we make our bed in Sheol, you're there. If we take up the wings of the morning or dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, you're there. Even if we say that the darkness would cover us and the light around us be night, darkness isn't dark to you, and night is bright as the day, because darkness is as light with you. Father, we appreciate uh, the ways in which, in your word, through your psalmist, you encourage us. You remind us that you are with us. You remind us how good it is to dwell together before you in worship and in prayer. Father, during this time, I pray for uh, just the different groups of people that are um, dealing with COVID-19 and struggling with different things. For those who've been laid off for a time, we pray for uh, their financial situation. For parents with kids at home, uh, we pray for them to have wisdom in terms of uh, teaching the kids and dealing with the stress of kind of a constant um, group of people, all needing stuff. Father, for those of us who live alone, I pray that you would be with us in our loneliness and that your presence would uh, really be clear to us this week. I pray for our small groups. I pray that they would be able to encourage each other uh, throughout this time and meet each other's needs as they arise. 
Father, I pray that your presence would be visible in our lives this week, that you would teach us through Rick's sermon, and that your Holy Spirit would superintend over our life and give us wisdom and grace and a sense of your presence. Amen. Let's continue in worship by singing the gospel. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom Come behold the wondrous mystery, be the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His suffering, never trace the no state of sin. See the true and better I come to save the help of man, Christ the great sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the land. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. By death, the God of but no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance! How unwavering our hope, Christ in power resurrected as we will. in power resurrected as we will be Our reading is from John 11, 1 through 15. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister said to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles 
because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Good morning, Red Cedar Church. My name is Abe Edwards, and I'm on the elder team here at the church. And thank you for joining us here this morning. If you're not a regular attender, and this is the first time you're tuning in, thank you and welcome. We are eagerly looking forward to the day when we can return to be together again. But even now, we know that where two or three are gathered together, Jesus himself is there. And even if you are listening to this service by yourself this morning, we pray that the sweet spirit of the Lord would give you comfort and peace. If you tuned in to the sermon last week, you heard Rick give us a homework assignment, which was to read John chapter 11. Now, what Rick did not know at the time was that I had pretty much written this whole sermon on John chapter 11. It's almost as if there is some higher power directing our worship. If you are like me, the last few weeks have been times of great emotion. To be honest, when Michigan State first put all classes online, I was surprised and thought this must be a temporary thing. And then when the governor came out with the stay-at-home order, I actually thought this could be kind of fun. So we stocked up on groceries and hunkered down to live like Little House on the Prairie, except with better internet. But then things continued to get worse. And more and more, the news became full of stories of disease and death and heartache and uncertainty. And then people that I greatly respect began to react quite differently to the crisis. And as the weeks passed, I started, I found myself swinging back and forth between trying to ignore the crisis and then spending way too much time checking my phone for news about what was going on. I caught myself silently judging people for reacting differently than I was. Sometimes I would spiral into a vortex of questions. What's the death toll? Are we flattening the curve? Are there enough ventilators? What is the progress on the vaccine? Who can I blame for all this? And then anger set in. At first it was just a frustration over things that I wanted to do but couldn't, like lost work opportunities and canceled travel plans. Then it turned into indignation when other people weren't following the rules like I was. And toward the end, it spiraled into a bitterness. And I began to ask questions like, is extending the stay-at-home order really the right thing to do? Is any of this doing any good? What gives the governor the right to keep my kids away from their grandparents? And so on. And in the middle of all of that, I realized it was my turn to preach a sermon. And I felt ashamed. There was a day in which I really felt like I was just an imposter elder. In fact, there was a moment in which I almost picked up the phone to call Rick and say, can you please get somebody else to preach next week because I have a lot going on. But thank God that he uses broken and cracked vessels to pour out his spirit. Thank God that the truth of scripture doesn't depend on how I feel. Thank God that he is unchanging, that his love is constant, and that he is forever patient with us. So let's pray this morning that God would speak to us in spite of the weakness of the preacher. And Father, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us today. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Invade our homes and invade our hearts 
with the truth of your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to talk today about one of my favorite passages of Scripture, which is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And if you grew up in the church or you've been in the church a long time, this is going to be a very familiar passage to you. And it could be that you have already thought about everything that I am going to say this morning. But yet, we hope that the Lord gives us fresh insight. And I hope that the lessons of this story give us both hope for eternity and also strength for today and for tomorrow. The story of Lazarus testifies that Jesus has power over death. But I also want to think today about a few parts of the story that give us hope, not just for the end of life, but for our everyday moments. So we read in John chapter 11 that a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And then we see that the sisters send word to Jesus, saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. So here we have Jesus confronted with the illness of his friend, an illness that could potentially be fatal. This is a crucial moment in the scriptures because if we are going to trust in Jesus, the one area in which we ought to be able to trust him is with death. If Jesus does not have power over death, then it really doesn't matter how much water he can turn into wine. It doesn't matter that he can feed 5,000 people with some bread and fish. It doesn't matter if he can make the blind see. We want to know as believers that when we pass through death's door, that Jesus is going to be right there with us, overcoming death for us. We want to be able to claim, as Paul did in 2 Corinthians, that when this earthly tent is destroyed, we have a new home, not made by hands, eternal in the heavens. And this is why the account of Lazarus is so important. It is a convincing miracle that Jesus has power over death and it foreshadows his own resurrection. Now, we don't know very much about Lazarus, other than he was a brother to Mary and Martha, and he was a friend to Jesus. In fact, the scriptures tell us that Jesus loved Lazarus, and yet Lazarus still gets sick and dies. So apparently, the fact that God loves you does not mean that you are going to be spared from sickness and death. And when sickness and death do come to a believer, we can have confidence to know that God's love abides with us even to eternity. And Jesus also loved Mary and Martha. And these sisters are concerned about their brother. But you could also think about this, that in the culture in which they lived as unmarried women, if Lazarus were to die, there could be nobody there who was going to take care of them. And yet when Jesus hears all of this news coming from the messenger, he does not hurry to Bethany. Verse 6 when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Jesus is seemingly in no hurry to help these frightened sisters, and he's in no hurry to save his dying friend. Now, in his words, in what Jesus says, he's very encouraging. He says, this sickness will not end in death. But his actions are confusing. He lingers long enough for Lazarus to die and to be buried, and after two days, he says to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and you were going back. And Jesus says, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. But what do we see? We see the disciples trying to tell Jesus, hey, the last time we were in Lazarus' neck of the woods, those people there tried to kill you. Maybe the disciples are thinking, that's suicide, man. You don't want to go back there. Maybe they're thinking, hey, look at all the success we're having here in this region. Look at the response you're getting to your ministry. The people in this region love you. This is the place where John the Baptist laid the groundwork for you. There's a harvest to be had here. Maybe they're thinking we should stay. And it's true that Jesus' ministry was experiencing success in the Transjordan region. People were turning from their sins. People were being healed. People were responding in great numbers. And Jesus says, let's go. 
Sometimes God's plan is confusing to us because he is looking beyond our visible circumstances. Sometimes things seem to be going great and God calls us to get up and move. And sometimes things seem to be dry and dead and Jesus says, let's stay. In the economy of the kingdom, visible evidence is not always a sign that the spirit is moving. I mean, let's be honest. If people looked in this church building this morning, they'd say it looks pretty empty. And yet we would say, no, the spirit is on the move. The kingdom is on the move in your homes, in hospitals, in your neighborhoods. The spirit is like the wind. You know not where it comes from, nor where it is going. And when the time is right, and only then, Jesus says, let's get going. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, verse 11, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am glad I am going there to wake him up. Verse 12, his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, look guys, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Now, did you catch what Jesus said there? Mary and Martha are grieving. The disciples are filled with fear. Lazarus is dead. And Jesus says, I am glad I was not there. What a statement. I am glad. Why didn't Jesus respond with swift action that would have saved Mary and Martha all of this sadness? Why didn't Jesus just heal Lazarus from a distance like he did the centurion's servant? Why does all of this human sorrow bring the Lord gladness? To quote Spurgeon, Christ is not glad because of sorrow, but on account of the result of it. He knows this temporary trial will lead to a greater faith, and he places such a high value on faith that he will not screen us from those trials by which faith is strengthened. It's hard to read those words, temporary trial, and not think about what's going on with this virus right now. But on the other hand, we think of ourselves as a pretty resilient people, don't we? I mean, deep down, we think that this is a temporary crisis, don't we? We're pretty convinced that in the long run, humanity is going to beat this virus. And we probably will. We may admit that life is going to remain confusing and strange for the foreseeable future, but we think that eventually it will go back to the way things were. And, and it, it might, it probably will. I suppose in the long run, we'll all see many of our relatives alive and healthy again, and most folks are gonna go back to work, and many people will become financially stable and will enjoy life's simple pleasures. I don't know, but I do know this, Scripture tells us that God's ultimate plans for us do not ultimately revolve around being healthy, around being financially stable, or even being happy. Jesus is touched by our infirmities, but he does not shield us from trials if those trials are meant to produce the faith that he desires. And when God seems to delay answering my prayers, I've got to think, does he have my ultimate needs in mind rather than my temporary ones? And maybe my desire to get back to a normal life needs to be tempered with the patient knowledge that God wants me to respond faithfully to this trial. Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, verse 16, let us also go that we may die with him. This is the disciple known as Thomas the Optimist, I think. Let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Boy, Martha just tells it like it is, doesn't she? It's hard not to read this as an accusation. Lord, if only, if only you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. And then we look down to verse 32. What does Mary say? 
Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And how many of us have had similar thoughts? If only. And if we haven't had those thoughts about God, how many of us have had those thoughts about ourselves? If only we could have got him to the doctor sooner. If only she had not been driving that night. If only he had had that surgery. If only he hadn't had that surgery. If only I'd listened better. If you are struggling with the if-onlys of life, then Jesus wants you to rest assured that all of those circumstances, all of those if-onlys, are within his control. As one writer put it, take all your if-onlys and write them down and put a big circle around them. That circle represents the providence of God. He is totally in control of those circumstances. We don't know what circumstances led to Lazarus' death. Maybe he contracted some disease, or he developed an infection, or he had heart problems. We don't know. But all of those things are only the secondary cause of Lazarus' death. The ultimate cause of Lazarus' death was God. God alone can take life. God alone can prolong life. He determines the length of our days, things which are out of our control, but which are firmly in his hands. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or the sword? No, for in all these things we are convinced that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And we are persuaded, are we not, that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things to come nor things present nor height nor depth nor any other thing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But sometimes I just need reminded of that. Martha says to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know, I, I, I know he will. I'll see him again, I'll see him in heaven. He will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And then Jesus must have looked right at her and said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Martha says, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. I am the resurrection and the life. This is the very name of God. I am, first spoken at the burning bush to Moses. Jesus uses this phrase seven times in the Gospel of John. He is making, uh, uh, leaving no doubt about his claim to be divine. For there is no other name under heaven by which we shall be saved but at the name of Jesus Christ alone. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Jesus declares with unquestionable authority that even death is within his providence, that when the day is done and all the cards are on the table and we are faced with our own mortality, that Jesus is right there overcoming death for us. Job 14:14. 14, 14, if a man dies, will he live again? Will he? To this, we confidently and courageously reply, yes, he will. He will live again. We have the words of Christ backed by his miraculous power. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied, and Jesus wept. In those two words, we see the humanity of Jesus. This is not some far away, distant God that cannot connect with our troubles. Yes, he was the Christ, the son of the living God, but he was also very much a man. He, he was described as, as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And remember what the writer of Hebrews says. He was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. Jesus has been, has been touched by our infirmities, and he is experiencing sorrow at the loss of his friend. But there's more to it than that. 
It's not just the pain that he feels at the loss of his friend. It's not just sympathy for Mary and Martha. Christ feels a much more transcendent pain. After all, a long time ago, Jesus saw a world that was good, in which there was no death, there was no sin, and there was no suffering. A newly created world. But now, in this passage, Jesus is surrounded by unbelievers in a nation of unbelievers, and he sees many people who are on a journey to eternal judgment because they will not receive him. He is able to look down through human history and see the generation of souls that are lost because they reject him. I think this is a moment of great agony for Christ. Maybe it's a little bit like the agony in the garden he, he, he had when he was anticipating the cross. Jesus shares in our sufferings, but, but not just those we feel at the loss of loved ones. He understands what sin has done to the world and what unbelief still does to people who reject him. And yet even that is within his providence. Verse 36, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. What's going to happen? Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, Martha said, he's been there for four days. Jesus said, did I not tell you if you believe you will see the glory of God? He's been there for four days. As if, as if it would have been easier for Jesus to raise Lazarus if he'd only been what, dead for one day or one hour? Or would it have been harder for Jesus to raise him if he'd dead for a hundred years? Death is death. And the Lord has power over death yesterday and today and tomorrow. Everyone is going to die and everyone is going to enter eternity. And everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the only way to receive life everlasting is to know and to personally believe in the one who can open the doors to eternity, to admit that we need a rescuer and to run toward him. Verse 41, so they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I think it was Augustine, or maybe Augustine, who said it was important for Jesus to call Lazarus by name. Otherwise, all the corpses in the cemetery would have come out. So Jesus says, this way out. And he is still calling you by name today. Sometimes Jesus calls with a loud voice, as in this passage, and sometimes softly and tenderly Jesus is calling. But the call is still there. It's still personal. It's still by name. Jesus is saying to you this morning, this is the way out. Now, he doesn't promise that he's, you're going to escape from sickness. He doesn't promise that you're going to achieve financial success. He promises a way out of death. Come out of that tomb you've been living in all these years and into a brighter, eternal future. It could be that you're listening to this message this morning and you have never yet heard that call. Hear it this morning. Trust in the only one who has power over death, in Jesus, who commands the dead to rise again, and who himself is the very embodiment of the resurrection. Before we close, I want to address a fact that for some of us as believers, the idea of our death and resurrection into eternal life is a somewhat distant reality. We know that one day when we die, we're going to join the Lord in paradise. But what, what about today? What difference does it make for me 
on this April morning that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So I want to leave you with just a couple things to think about. Reasons why it matters in our daily walk that Jesus is the resurrection. First of all, because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, we can trust that God will do the impossible to get his lost children back. No matter how far we run, no matter how hard we try to hide, nothing can lure us away for very long. Not fear, not anger, not frustration, not hardship or loss or greed or worldly gain, not even death can separate the believer from God, not just in eternity, but today. Oh yes, I have spent some hours lately, far too many, distracted and frustrated. But God's resurrecting love is like this powerful magnet continually drawing me back to him. And we don't persevere in our daily walk because we're good at persevering or because we are good at toughing things out. We persevere each day because God's grace is irresistible to believers. And when he says, get going, we will get up and get going. Second, Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, we can trust God's promises despite what we might see with our eyes. God has promised that he will lead us in paths of righteousness and even if we walk through the valleys of death. He promises never to leave us nor forsake us. He says you are not alone. Despite what you might see with your eyes, he sees further and he plans accordingly. And finally, because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, we can rest. We can rest in the knowledge that because of his own death and resurrection, Christ himself is our life. Christ himself is our holiness. Christ himself is our acceptance before God. We don't need to figure everything out. I don't always have to have the right reaction to life's circumstances. I can rest because no matter how crazy things get in this world, we are loved with an amazing and unbreakable love. And we can have confidence that God is for us and that he is, right now, transforming our hearts. Despite our faults, despite the chaos in the world, despite the turmoil, despite the frustrations that I still feel, we can rest in Jesus' love today. I'd like to close with a few words from a very old song, words from over a hundred years ago that still seem as if they could have been written this week. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he seems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day, the Lord himself is with me, with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me, he whose name is counselor and power. I love this part. He whose name is counselor and power The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As thy days, thy strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to us he made. Jesus, whose name is Counselor and Power, has taken it upon himself, the protection of his children. If you're a believer, he has made you his child and his treasure. His strength is sufficient for today and for every day because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Well, Red Cedar Church family, before we head into our weeks, I have a couple updates for you. First, Tuesday prayer times will continue. At noon each Tuesday, a group of us gathers on a Zoom call to ask God to do his work in and through us and through 
those in need of prayer throughout our community and throughout our country. We'd love for you to join us on that if you're able. You can do that by clicking the link below on Tuesday at 12 p.m. We're also on the hunt to hear how God is working in our homes during the coronavirus. If you have a moment and could just put together a 30 second uh, to five minute clip sharing how you've seen God at work. It doesn't have to be anything fancy or well honed or edited. If you could take a video and send it to us, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we won't be using all of the content from all the videos, but we're eager to share with the congregation what God is doing through us, his people. So now Red Cedar Church, I'd like to send you out in the name of our risen savior. You who were dead in your trespasses, God has made alive together with Jesus, having forgiven us all our sins by canceling the record of debt that stood against us along with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus. So may you go this week free in the resurrection life that Jesus gives. And all God's people said, amen.